everybody. Welcome back to Ghost with Twin Peaks Podcast. I'm Charles Skaggs, here on a rainy and windy and lehy Columbus, Ohio night. With, ready to talk some Twin Peaks once again with Sam Sprouse, a wonderful co-host. We just got done talking to a bunch of Doctor Who, so hopefully we got that out of our system. Yeah, we're, we're primed to be nerding it up tonight. How are you doing, Charles? I'm, we're, I'm good. I missed talking to you. We had a skip week last week, but we're yes. back and we're going to talk some Twin Peaks. So we're back with a vengeance. Back with a vengeance. So we're back on the ven- farm. Ghostwood. On the dead dog farm. Ghostwood with a vengeance. Ghostwood. Dun, 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 dun. With Samuel Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of that, did you see McLean! Captain Marvel? No. What? Did I what? Did, did I see, you see Captain Marvel? I, of course, I saw Captain Marvel. I haven't got my review up yet. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm almost finished with it. But yes, uh, Samuel L. Jackson's really good in that because we get to see young Samuel L. Jackson thanks to the wonders of CGI and a decent special effects budget. Yes. Well, I think honestly, Samuel L. Jackson doesn't look that different. He just has different hair. Well, he has. You give him some hair. One, he has hair for one. You can he, give him some hair and make sure that it's black hair and not like salt and pepper hair. Right. He kind of just looks like Jurassic Park, Samuel Jackson. Yeah, well, that would be, I'm sure that was the blueprint. It's Hold like, on to your butts. Yeah, exactly. Well, because remember, this was Captain Marvel set in the '90s, so that would be Jurassic Park, which was 1994, right? Jurassic Park was '92 or three, I think. Okay, I thought it was '94, but yeah. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. So maybe it's maybe. Well, it's... I it was '94 because I was still in high school. Okay, now you got to now you're gonna make me look this up now. I'm gonna make you look it up, and I'm saying '93. See, we were almost we were almost talking Twin Peaks there for a second. We got really close. See, well, yeah. All right. There's yeah, the IMDb. Captain Marvel takes place in '95. Uh, right. So and, there, of uh, course, you had has, a lot had a lot of good, you know, your obligatory Nirvana garbage REM references. Yeah, garb uh, Nirvana and REM are the only male. 1993. You are correct. Yes. You are the winners. Who is the king? You are. Who's the master? Show enough. Who is the king? So, yeah, the the only male bands on the soundtrack were Nirvana and Ariam. Right. It was female because you had, music, you had really Elastica, cool. you had Garbage, and, and you had Hole, which you is had you hole, know right. Ugly. But I would have been sure. really bummed if they had had Hole on there, but not Nirvana. That would have been a problem. That yes. would have been a major problem. I I agree. And I appreciate that I, they went with Come As You Are for their Nirvana song as opposed to um, Smells Like Teen Spirit. Well, Come As You Are is a perfect song for right. that that bit. Yes. That was in. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm just saying it was perfect for exactly. that. Exactly. But uh, no, I absolutely loved it. And if you're one of the haters on the internet that like girl superheroes, right? You mean one of the incel? Feel free to stop downloading us. One of the one of the <laughs> incel haters on the internet. One of the chads. One of the chads. <laughs> Chad. Yeah, it's probably Chad was definitely one of the guys that was probably hating on Captain Marvel on the internet. See, that's the weird thing about us is that in our world, like yeah. the Chad is is the the horrible person, but to the incels, yeah. the Chad is the guy that gets girlfriends. Somebody so. needs to make that a meme that Chad was like, you know, trolling on the internet about Captain Marvel from his jail cell. From his jail cell, yes. Like Captain Marvel was the worst Marvel film ever. Exactly. It'd be so great. <laughs> See, we kind of tied it into Twin Peaks. We got there. Yeah, we did our best. We did our we best. We tried. All right, so here in episode 52, we're going to talk about Dead Dog Farm. Dead Dog Farm. All right. So Dead Dog. Dead Dog. So, uh, yeah, so hopefully if you're, you know, like my wife and you're, you're very protective of animals, you won't be offended by the title Dead Dog Farm. There are no dead dogs at Dead Dog Farm as far as we know. So. Well, as they say in Twin Peaks, that Dead Dog Farm is named after sort of a, a legend. Yes. That yeah, actually, the have... best and the worst of us are right. always drawn to a dead dog. Right. And, you know, the worst of us will... The rest of us struggle they'll, in between. They'll struggle, you know... Yes. Only those most the... of us turn away. Right. The, the worst of us will turn away from the dead dog and the best of us 
with the pure, purest of heart. feel yeah. its pain. Yeah. And the rest of us struggle somewhere in between. Right. So, so, thank you. so yeah, thank definitely you, have everything to do with the dead dogs. Thank you, Irene Little Horse, for that. Yes. Yeah. So we'll talk about her. Realtor. We're going to talk about her in a minute. That, see, that, realtor, that, that's, that, that's like, a, like a really be a really weird spinoff series. Irene Little Horse, real Twin Peaks realtor. No, yeah. so, so, <laughs> selling, all, selling all these weird properties with like that have sordid histories and, and strange other dimensional connections. Well, this is the Briggs house. Now, occasionally you're going to disappear if you right, live here. Yeah, you might end up and, going through time, but and uh, there might be a vortex the, or something haunts the place so don't even think about smoking in here right now this is the old place and is your name chalfont because if it's not i can't sell this house to you right no well you well what if it's like um oh, it could be chalfont or tremont, tremont that's it yes exactly it could be tremont yeah. could be chalfont but anything else is right out that's that's a, that's it that's it that's fine. now this is a lower property it's a plot of land at the trailer park yes. and the guy who runs it don't ever ring his doorbell before 9 a.m <laughs> that's the one thing you need to remember living here exactly well you figured somebody had yeah. to sell they had to sell the trailer park after um carl carl died. rod passed away yeah sadly somebody yeah. had to buy that thing i hope somebody's still feeding them at the trailer park right you know who knows maybe um people selling blood for food Maybe Becky took it over. Colorado. Who knows? Yep. All right. So, uh, but yeah, we're going to talk about this. Uh, this is a a storyline that took place over the course of four episodes, some of which we've already talked about, but only other segments, of course. Uh, this mm-hmm. started in uh, December 8th, 1990, with Dispute Between Brothers, then it carried on the next week with Masked Ball, and then uh, Black Widow, as we jumped ahead a month for the next episode of January 1991 and then it finished up a week later and checkmate on January 19th, 1991. So, and the reason we're not doing these individual episodes is because they are a little too jam packed full of storylines. Right. And they're kind of all over the place. It's they're kind of all over the place and they're sort of trying to feel their way around what to do in this sort of, to, to, to me, there's, there's two twin. There's two eras of Twin Peaks, the original series. There's there's the Laura Palmer era, right? And then there's the Wyndham Earl era. This is and, the, this is that kind of limbo in between. This is that limbo in between, but they're trying to trying to figure it out, and it's kind of good because the and I think Dead Dog Farm is a good transition story for right, it, right? Because it's a it's a way to keep Cooper in town. For a little bit longer right before setting up the next major storyline because i think if i think if like the day of leland palmer's funeral he gets his first package from Wyndham earl that'd be a little too like really yeah. <laughs> that just seems a little, a little too, too convenient, unreal convenient yeah exactly right he needs that sort of winding down period and then something else to happen to keep him in town and then Wyndham Earl hits, which is really just what Cooper needs right about now is this Wyndham Earl storyline. Right. So, and you know, we're starting, we're going through all these stories of other people in the he, town. He needs, that, he needs that, like a knife in the gut. He, seriously. Like he needs another hole in the head. Yeah, exactly. And so we're going with these stories with other people in the town. And some of them I find more engrossing than I find others like dead dog farm. Right. And the, and you know, what the hell's up with Josie, the Josie story. Um, Cause that's, she's been so mysterious. That's an interesting story to figure out what's going on with her. How's it going to affect Harry? Right. What's going to happen. And it sets up one of the, one of the equally satisfying and depressing moments of the final episode. Yes. Because you hate those people. So what happens to them, you're kind of like, okay, that, that makes sense. <laughs> yes. Well, and then it also ties up a lot of the loose ends of Jean Renault left over from um, Audrey being held captive at the... Uh, at, That's at what the, Dead Dog Farm does. Yeah. yeah. At, at so Dead Dog Farm is going to yeah. tie up a lot of that stuff. It's the nail in Hank Jennings' coffin. Right. Um, you know, and we have other storylines going along, like the James Hurley saga, which we talked about last time. Right. 
um, The Adventures of Nadine in High School, mm-hmm. which is just sort of a less funny version of that st- of Strangers with Candy. <laughs> it's, like, it's like the Twin Peaks version of Strangers right. with Candy. And then, um, um, which kind of makes sense, yeah, because, yeah, we had... Um... Strangers with Candy, if you don't remember, that yes. is an Amy Sedaris that's sitcom where she's like That's who I was, trying, like that's who I was trying to think of, thank you. And in high school. Yes. So... Yeah. Um, and the whole gag was just yeah. like, she's just like way too old to be at high school. You know? So it's, it's kind of like the, right. um, that whole meme uh, where you've got um, Steve Buscemi as a high school student. Uh-huh. Like, like yeah. what's up, my fellow kids? Or, you know, what's up, my fellow kids? Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and you have the, so you have the, the adventures of Nadine in high school. And then you have the, um, Problem child plot line with little Nikki. Right, which we don't care about. Which we really kind of don't care about because it has one good moment, which is the, so, the storytelling uh, of Dr. Hayward telling the story of little Nikki's tragic. Yes. <laughs> tragic and then, and then Andy and Dick crying. Over it. Yeah, but the thing about it is, is it spends way too much on the character of Dick Tremaine than yes. we need to. Right. Because we hate Dick Tremaine. There, there is one successful love story in Twin Peaks, and it's Andy and Lucy. Exactly. We've talked about this. We know they're going to get together. We're rooting for them. We want it to happen. There's no reason for them to not be together, you know, except Dick Tremaine, which isn't really a reason. Dick Tremaine is a complete and total goofball. Right. There's no reason why he should it's, be taking that away. Dick Tremaine is just essentially the result of Lucy being indecisive about what she wants. Exactly, but the re- but I don't want to see more Dick Tremaine. So yeah, the little Dicky storyline is yeah. completely boring. And then we had, um, we had we had the disappearance of window of uh, Major Briggs. Disappearance of Major Briggs, and then we have the descent into madness of uh, ben, and ben, and, ben and back and back out smelling sweet on the other side of Benjamin Horn. Yeah, Ben Horn Civil so, War that we have. So, we yeah. it. <laughs> Just want to say it's the Pacific Northwest. Why the Confederacy? It's it does seem like a rather odd. Um, that's just how crazy connection. he really is. Exactly. Like yeah. maybe he was <laughs> maybe he was watching Gone with the Wind the night before and it just burrowed somewhere in, deep into his subconscious. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, or, who knows? Or, but hey, it's symbolism of the civil war going on inside his brain. Yup. Yup. So there this is a so this is sort of a, a Cooper segue. This is this is something that this is a yep. thing that Cooper has to overcome in order to deal with the window moral story, which is, I think a wonderful storyline. Right. I like it quite a bit. But, uh, and so what's happening for Cooper is we've had the, the wake for Leland Palmer. Right. He's been buried and the Laura Palmer case is as closed as it's going to possibly be. Um, Leland is the one who technically physically killed all those people. He's in the ground. Leo Johnson is still in a coma. There's not a lot anybody can do. I mean, you, you can't arrest Bob. So How long there's was not much I going out? on. <laughs> 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 25 years, Cooper, but your suit still fits perfectly. Exactly. So Cooper is about to. And your hair gel is immortal. Oh, it's immortal. So Cooper's about to go yeah. fishing with major Briggs one last time before he leaves town to go back to Washington DC or Philadelphia. I think is it Philadelphia that he's at? Oh, um, I believe he's still out of Philadelphia office because that's where we had the whole, um, back East. He's going back back East. east. Just say that. Yes. Yeah. And unfortunately, internal affairs, Agent Roger Hardy comes in with uh, yeah. Mountie King right. from Canada, saying, "Yeah, you're not going anywhere." There's, D- the, you know, I, I have do right. Yes, Dudley, exactly. Or actually, Dudley do wrong. Dudley case. totally do wrong. Yep. And he he says, "Yeah, you're kind of not going anywhere because the Canadian government has told me all about how you crossed the border, killed some people at a whorehouse, and stole the cocaine they were using in a sting." Oh, and by the way, because you're suspended of- from the FBI. And give me your badge and your gun. Yes. Yeah. So you're suspended from the FBI because 
Mountie King says that they had been doing a sting operation to try and catch Jean Reno for like the last two years. And Cooper comes in and blows everything. And then all of a sudden, the they were using for the sting has gone missing. And they suspect Agent Cooper. Right, oh, because nobody Cooper, else could have stolen the cocaine. It had to be Cooper. Yeah, there's no... What, this town is not like... Not like this town is full of cocaine runners. It had to be the like guy that. with the exemplary FBI record. Exactly. Exactly. So... Cooper fully admits to the fact that he did not contact Canadian authorities, that he crossed the border knowingly to get Audrey Horn because he felt that the danger Audrey was in was, 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 was too imminent to ignore and to go through proper. Ch- it was too he needed to rescue her as fast as possible. Exactly. He couldn't he, yeah. There forward. wasn't time to get the pro- go through the proper channels, essentially. Right. So, he knew what was happening. Yeah. So and, he, he took it upon his initiative. He was, and with Cooper, it's interesting because he's, he's willing to accept these consequences of his actions. Like he feels like, right. I know I went outside, established bureau guidelines. I'm willing to pay the price for that. And he says, I know that I killed the bodyguard. That was self-defense. I know Jean Renault killed Blackie. And this is the right. first time hearing of Emory Battis dying. Right. And, so he, and he's, got he was unaware. Wit- he's got Harry as a witness. He's got Harry as a witness. And and he's got Hawk as a witness. He's got Hawk as a witness. So, too, so, yes. And he even says, they said, you have 24 hours to bring together a defense. And he comes in and he says, I have no defense. I did all this except for the drugs. I don't know what you're talking about with the drugs, but I, I, I know that I did out, operate outside of Bureau regulations, and I will pay the price. For it. And I was aware of that when I did it. Yeah. So, so, it, here we so are. it's at that point he surrenders his gun and his badge, which is a big mm-hmm. deal if you're Cooper. Big deal if you're Cooper. Yeah, this is like chopping yeah. off his arm at this point. Not just his gun and his badge, his black suit. Yeah, exactly. He, starts, he has to trade he in he his black to... suit for... Red plaid flannel and a fisherman's jacket. Best. Yeah, like khakis and flannel is what he turns it in for. Which Albert Rosenfeld says is fashion suicide, but somehow Cooper makes it work. Exactly. So. <laughs> so. I, and I think it's funny that, you know, he's here he is, he's all decked out in the flannel, and he still has his slicked back hair with the hair gel. Oh, it's so great. Which complements it's, the look perfectly, perfect. right? Yep. So, Looks but very, here's the very thing. outdoorsy. Mm-hmm. He's still very outdoorsy. He's still, he's still totally roughing it. Yes. That's so roughing, that's roughing it for Cooper. Here's the thing about this whole, this whole accusation. Right. Is that Mounty King is working for Jean Renault as one of the drug runners. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, 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 dun. So Jean Renault and Mountie King have put together this little motley crew of drug runners, including Hank Jennings and Ernie. Those respectable fellows. Uh-huh. You know. Norma's stepfather. So this is this is, you know, just looking at the cast of characters this is not going to end well. No, so, exactly. So right. So basically they're going to the shady of the shady. Right. And, and so that so, cocaine. So we have, so that we have this missing? little we have this little conspiracy. Essentially, yes. Here. The cocaine that's missing will have it, and they need to raise about one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, and so somehow they're going to be selling this cocaine. Right. So they have to they have to figure that one out somehow, and and because of the drugs being involved, this is going to involve the DEA. Right. So. So, yeah, so basically we find out, we get a, in the next episode, Mass Ball, Gordon mm-hmm. Cole calls in. To it's offer, Gordon. It's Gordon. Gordon Cole. Gordon Cole. So he calls to, Coop, you have my full support. And the DEA is sending down a top dog. Yep, a top dog. So. Who Cooper knows. Right. As a Dennis Bryson. Right. DEA agent. Things have changed though since Cooper know, knew Dennis back in the day. There's a yes, there's a bit of true. there's a uh, bit of a status update regarding Dennis. 
Bit of a status update regarding Dennis. Dennis prefers to go by Denise now. Right. After real after coming to a personal realization during a sting operation where he had to where they were selling drugs to a guy who only wanted to deal with transvestites. Right. So as part of the sting operation, he's the one that dressed up as a woman and then realized how much more comfortable he was yes. that way. And just started doing it all the time and became Denise right. Bryson. Oh, and, and should we mention that, oh, by the way, Denise Bryson's played, of course, by David Duchovny. By David Duchovny. As in who? Fox Mulder. David as in Fox Mulder. Yes. Yeah. Um, who has pretty much the best legs I've seen on a film since Betty Grable. He does. He, he does. And it, he, it was a good color on him. It is a great color on him, yes, and is. those those are. I think he waxed himself for this That's, role. That was, one of my, that was one of my favorite Hawk lines as, as I was job. going through this this rewatch, where Hawk said, "You know, like he's introduced to Denise for the first time. Mm-hmm. He's like, it's a good color on her. <laughs> All matter of like, color. <laughs> <laughs> which for the, the 90, kind of which, surprise, for the but... which for the nineties was actually a pretty progressive comment. <laughs> That's the thing about this." It's it's extremely progressive for 1990, right. this episode, because there's not. Well, de- well Denise, is es- all, Denise is essentially like the first major transgender character, right? I don't even know if Denise is trans. I don't even. Yeah, she's well, transgender. But she's well, well, at this point, she's essentially she's transse- like, she's transsexual. She hasn't really. She's not even tra- like. Transition. She's not even like you know, she's transvestite for sure, right? But they don't even know what to call it at the time, right? It was, this now is, this is know, before the term transgender, essentially. Right. We, now, now we know that that somebody who does not identify gender normatively, yeah, with the norms that are assigned to their chromosomes and or genitals, right, is somebody who's considered transgender or gender fluid, that sort of a thing. But back then, it was all transvestites and sex changes, and right. that, that was all you had. I mean, and you didn't talk about it. Like, the, the only person I knew... They had transvestites and cross-dressers. That was basically And cross-dressers, it. yeah. And that was about it. And then you had... And anybody who went from being male to female or female to male is somebody who... And we just said they had a sex change, is what, that, is what it was called. That was the term we used. And for years, the only person who I had ever known about... For that was Wendy Carlos for years and years and years. And then it was Chaz Bono. Right. And now it's something we talk about all the time because we're finding terms for it. We're finding definitions for it. People are starting to, um, I don't want to say the term think outside the, but they're becoming, they're becoming aware. They're starting to allow themselves to not be defined by their physiology right and so they're not, people they're are not talking just, about that they're before. not just being classified in the little specific groups anymore right exactly exactly so but that wasn't a thing that much in the 90s and if and if there was somebody who had a sex change is what we called it back then it's like you never really talked about it and everybody was never sure like do we say she do we say he um and what's fun about the Denise character is that everybody around her is just so very accepting. And she's very, yeah, I love talking about my experience. Ask me any questions you want to ask me. Right. Because she's very open about it. And so it's. So, yeah. Um, so, you know, Denise was very, yeah, just this for the time period was just this mm-hmm. amazingly ahead of her time character. Exactly. And the only the only thing we'd ever seen anything like Denise Bryson at the time was Klinger, and Klinger was right. well, Klinger pretending. was just wearing crazy. dresses just because he was trying to get out of the army. He was trying to he was trying to seem crazy and get out of the army. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So it's, it wasn't it's, even it's not like he was identifying as a woman. He was just like, I'm a guy wearing a woman's dress to get out of the army. Look at me, aren't I nuts? Send yeah, me yeah, home. Whoa, and that yeah, yeah, that was the thing back in the seventies. If you were a man dressed like a woman, you were crazy. You know, or you had it was a gag. Yeah, it was a gag. Or we had famous drag queens like like Divine, right? That kind of stuff. But again, that was very sub- Divine was a very subversive crowd. You know that that John Waters crowd that was not very mainstream back in 1990. No. If you ask the t- still to this day, if you ask the average person who who Divine is, they can't tell you. Right. 
So it's not, you know, yeah, it's like, is that somebody is that, that was in De- dressed ate poop in that one movie? Yeah, that's who Divine is. Was that somebody <laughs> that was in Destiny's Child? <laughs> but um, so yeah, it's it was again, and I can't say it enough that we have the television that we have today because of Twin Peaks. Yes, again, this Denise Price is an example of that. Yeah, this is yeah, this is exa- You're right, exactly. This is a perfect example of just like how innovative Twin Peaks was back in the day mm-hmm. and still yes. is essentially. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Uh, all right. Um, now after, um, after Cooper gets that call from Gordon, he gets set down in front of a, the panel of guys led by Roger Hardy. Mm-hmm. And this is where he's flat out says, I'm innocent of any criminal wrongdoing. And yep. he's confident that he made the right choices. Yes. And Roger's all like, well, you know, this is what I expect from a bureau guy. But um, he says that uh, he warns him that, like, well, you might be extradited for drug trafficking and murder. And he also recommends, of course, a full psychological workup because Cooper. So. Right. Right. So and that's the thing is and he even he even says. You know, so we, I only killed one person, and I have witnesses saying that that was going to be in self-defense. Right. So, so, and he so, totally cops. To, so essentially, like, Rogers may be trying to give him an out, like, well, hey, we could just say that because you're you, it would be really easy to say you had some kind of psychotic break to explain this. Right. So exactly. That, so it doesn't look bad on the Bureau. Right. But Cooper's not even, he, Cooper's not having any of that. He's saying, no. look, I was trying to save an 18-year-old girl. From being tortured by these people, you know, I did what I had to do, and yeah, he's not—he's not making it easy for Roger, to say the least. No, he's not. No, he's not. Cooper has. has an exemplary record, and he's not—he's he's not losing his temper. He's not getting emotional or anything like that. He's very confident in what he did, and he knows that he didn't take those drugs. Yeah. So he's like, "Look, we'll figure that out." But you know, it's not. Uh, you kind of have to wonder even, if you kind of have to wonder if Albert, what Albert would have been like in that same situation. Oh man, that would have <laughs> Albert would have been. Can you imagine in the Albert versus you know Hardy at that point at that moment? That is that is a battle of wills that is. That's like an atomic bomb place. waiting to go off. Would have been. Oh my god! Yeah, it, would have been such, it would have been such good television. <laughs> oh man, but even you know even when Denise comes in and says you know Cooper did you do it? He's like I you know I think I'm being framed and. So he's talking about it with her and he's like, yeah, it smells like a, a standard frame, frame up coop, but I'm going to need something more than just your opinion. And so that's when they start to figure out that they're going to need to, they need to find out where the drugs are in order to exonerate Cooper. Yeah. Because we're not sure. We're not quite sure who's framing him yet. They're not quite sure who's framing him yet. So it's probably Jean Renault who is kind of taken over at this point. And it's been a bad week to be Benjamin Horn. Yes. Because Benjamin Horn started off being arrested for the murder of Laura Palmer. And the only way he could get out of that was to have Catherine Martell tell the police that he spent the night with her instead of killing Laura Palmer. And to do that, he has to only, oh, gee, sign over Ghostwood and the, the Packard sawmill back to her. And the sawmill. Back to back to Captain so, so all this his big investment plan went away. Mm-hmm. He, he was accused, lost his some right. social credibility. He lost some credibility there, and the fact that his solicitor was the actual murderer, right? Leland Palmer, right? Is not good for business. No, so, no doesn't really speak people well. aren't necessarily lining up to do right. business with him or anything like that. He doesn't have any no. deals anymore. So and see nowadays, those... nowadays that would have just made him president. Yeah, seriously, <laughs> right? Yeah, failing at all your business ventures—that's apparently yeah. qualification. You have, for a, president. you have a shady lawyer that's like done horrible things. Well, hey, you know, yeah, that's and, just going to get and you none in the of your White business House. ventures ever took a profit. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So he's got he's got some problems. And then he has Hank Jennings coming in saying, oh, hey, guess what? I don't work for you anymore. And you're out of One-Eyed Jacks. 
And he's like, what the hell are you talking about? I own one IGX. He's like, yeah, well, there's new management in town. So you're out, Ben. You're out. So they are ousting Benjamin Horn because Jean Reno is sort of completely taking over. Yeah. And so this so, so, sort of. So Ben's out. Jean Reno moving in. Moving in. And he's getting, basically he's al- aligned himself with, you know, the shadiest of the shady of Twin Peaks. Shady, but also the, the the most inept. Right. You know. Yeah. I think if Jean Reno had been able to hook up with Leo Johnson, yes, the cops would have had a much harder time bringing this down. Yeah. Because I'm sorry, Hank and Ernie. Yeah. That's kind of yeah. it's team bad criminal essentially. That's like just bumbling. That's like bumbling idiots right there. It's so it's kind of ridiculous. So, right. um, so yeah, Hank is uh. You know, Hank's kind of basically acting like he's going to threaten Benjamin Horn. Right. And because he comes in and, and Benjamin Horn is like, uh, what do I pay you for? You know, Catherine Martell is still alive. He's like, well, you don't pay me anything anymore anyway, because I'm not working for you anymore. So, but waiting in the wings is a young, hungry man with entrepreneurial spirit. And a girlfriend who no longer can work because she has to take care of her comatose husband. Right. right. Bobby Briggs. Do, do we want to save all this for if when we talk if we talk uh, Ben Civil War period? We could talk a little bit, but we need to talk about Bobby becoming Benjamin Horn's new right hand man because, oh, yeah, yeah, because of, the, of the folder. Yeah. Because of the photographs. Okay. Yeah. You're right. So I, 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 Bobby is. I take your point. Sniffing around looking for a job. Yeah. And Benjamin Horn has basically been in his office drinking, smoking cigars, and not shaving. <laughs> and this is, of course, before he puts on his Confederate yeah. uniform. He's basically not, lo- it's not looking good at this point. It's not looking good for Ben Horn. You, know, you just want to say thank God for Jerry and his weed farms. <laughs> you know? Just mellowing him out. Well, no, I'm just saying that this that after everything that went down here, this family is kind of going into ruin, you this know. And true. I'm sure that that legalized weed farm brought them back up to where they were and ten times stronger. So he he's kind of stringing Bobby along, but then Bobby comes in at just the right time. He's like, "Hey, I want you to do something for me. I want you to ho- follow Hank Jennings and tell me what he's up to and who he's up to it with." So. Now Bobby's on the right, and Bobby coming around is kind of like making Audrey go, "What? What's going on?" And it's making me go, "What? What's going on? Why are these two people not in high school still?" <laughs> Why is like, anybody I mean, not in are, high school anymore? What happened to high school? Because it's still it's still the same school year. I mean, they haven't it hasn't been graduation yet, right? <laughs> oh, it's like Don is still in high school. Mike's still in high school. Nadine is in high school. Why aren't the but Bobby you know, and Don and Bobby and uh, Audrey, Audrey, Audrey? Yeah, are, Some, somehow they they're yeah. not in high school. I don't I don't quite get it, but okay. So she sees her dad and Bobby meeting up, and she's probably wondering to herself, okay, Bobby was Laura's girl, Laura's boyfriend, and my dad had a thing with Laura that was seedy. What's going on with Bobby? So she sees the drop of the envelope for money that Bobby gives, and you know she's looking through her little hole in the wall that she sneaks right. into. Then she goes in later and takes the pictures and brings them to Cooper because she's still, she's still trying to. Well, she wants, she wants for agent Cooper. Exactly. But she also feels like, well, Hey, this is a kind of a way I can make that inroad a little bit and and, and act like, like, Hey, I'm helping his investigation. I'm helping. I'm I'm sort of good at what I can do. I can be good at this. And yeah. so she comes to his room and says, I have something for you. These are pictures my father paid for. Cooper looks at them. And that's when we find that's when Cooper finds out that all these four guys are working together. And that's when he finds out that Mountie King is in on this. Exactly. That's that's how Cooper learns about that. And Denise is that's there, so- by the way, at this point. I'm sorry. Denise is there at this point. In Not Cooper- just yet. Well, not, not, not well, in, no, well, let's see, Audrey visits Cooper and then Denise enters after. Well, but after, but yeah, but, but, but when she first shows him the photos, Denise isn't there yet. That's true. 
And so he says, Audrey, you just may have saved my life. She's like, did I do good? He says, you did better than good. You may have saved my life. And she said, so I guess we're yeah. even. So, and then she which, kisses, which is a line she, of Audrey's I really like. Of course, it. she kisses him on the way out. Yeah, she kisses him on the way out. But, but then uh, Agent Bryson comes in and Audrey is totally enthralled by Agent Bryson. And she's like, they have women agents? <laughs> and Agent Bryson says, more or less. <laughs> And so that kind of inspires Audrey. And, you know, she says to, she says to Cooper, you know, in a few years, I'm going to be all grown up and I'm going to, I'm going to have my shit together yep. and I'm going to come find you, Dale Cooper. And, you know, this, this whole speech she's giving is just making me want to start to cry because <laughs> I know what happened. Right. Exactly. It does, obviously doesn't turn out that way. You would think Audrey right. would have been inspired and went on to join the FBI and become a full agent. Yeah. No. That's not what happens. No. And it, it, I would have loved it if, if Tammy Preston had been Audrey. That would have been super cool. Oh, yeah. But, you know, she's a little too involved in the case. I think it probably wouldn't have happened. But that, without, Yeah, that would have been cool. Like if, if Audrey had changed her name or whatever and just she didn't, mm-hmm. didn't want to associate with her father anymore. So she invented, something. reinvented herself. Yeah, something. Or just went, you know, went to the FBI and became something major and then came home to investigate this. Who knows? But Right. So she kisses Cooper on the way out. And then Cooper tells, you know, Bryson that he has this new evidence. He's like, yeah, whatever. How old is that girl? Right. And this is, this is one of my favorite lines in Twin Peaks, which is why I want to talk about it. Yeah. And he says, he says, Denise, I didn't think you would uh, still be interested. He's like, you know, I may be wearing a dress, but I still put my pantyhose on one leg at a time. If you know <laughs> what I mean. That's a good line. And then Cooper just says, not really. <laughs> But I love that. I may be wearing a dress, but I still put my pantyhose on one leg at a time, if you know what I mean. Well, that just kind of, just kind of shows that even though, yeah, he, he is a transvestite, he still is essentially straight as far as romance goes. Exactly. And that's, you know, that's the thing that... Like he's still attracted is, to women, even though he dresses as a woman. Right. And that's and another thing that now today is more common knowledge, that just because you don't identify as your physiological gender... Right. That doesn't necessarily mean that you are all of a sudden the, 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 like if you go from being a man to a woman, you don't become automatically, you don't become just like a woman that likes men. You don't become like a, a lesbian when that happens. You don't become like a straight woman necessarily who likes men or a gay man. It's like you can identify as a woman, but still like women Yeah. or you can identify as a woman and like men, it's like being, being transgender doesn't mean you're a lesbian and being a lesbian doesn't mean you're transgender. I mean, so it's like, that's more of a common knowledge these days, but back then it was like, Oh, that's a woman now. So obviously they like men. It's no, that's not how it is. But. And, and again, it's, it's Twin Peaks being a very progressive show. Um, right. And this is their funny because, little because, way of explaining that not everybody's that way. Yeah. It's just like, just because, you know, you have this guy who, you know, wants to dress like a woman doesn't make him mean that he's gay. No, that doesn't mean that at all. Yeah. And, and, and for back then, you know, because always no. like you figured people associated anybody, any man that wore a woman's dress, they had to be gay. Right. Mm-hmm. So here's Denise who showed like, well, Hey, just because I am wearing women's clothes doesn't mean I'm, I'm gay. Which is so yeah, that, exactly. So that was just essentially that was another groundbreaking moment back. Then yeah, exactly. I, I don't think a lot of people appreciate. No, that's like I said, we would not have the television we have today if we had not had Twin Peaks. Yeah. So. But um, so it's about this time that Cooper, even with all this stuff going on, you know, he's lost his gun, he's lost his badge, he's under suspension, and all these, you know, all this stuff going on behind the scenes. He decides, no, now's a good time to go house hunting. Well, because he gets a new job. Right. Well, no, 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 this is before he gets deputized. Is it before he gets deputized? Yes. Okay. Yeah, he gets deputized later. Okay. But, um, at least I'm pretty sure. Let me double check. Yeah, you might be right. I think it is. I think it's just before he gets deputized. But, um, that uh, oh yeah it's it's kind of yeah it's, he doesn't get deputized until the final episode of the storyline okay so, okay so this is the episode before that 
Gotcha. So, so before he's deputized, uh, he meets up with Irene Littlehorse, realtor of Twin Peaks. Mm -hmm. And he's interested in cottages on the lake. Apparently, he's looking for some nice waterfront property. Can't blame him. It's beautiful country up exactly. there. Exactly. Very scenic. Got to, got to find out what kind of trees are around this lake. They're really something. Really something. So, so in only Cooper fashion, he had, Irene shows him pictures of all these different properties. He picks. He picks. There are two that he wants to that he likes the most. But so yeah, he narrows it down. But then he leaves it up to a coin flip. Mm -hmm. So he takes out what looks like a um, a silver dollar or something, or if it's like a fifty cent piece, I'm not sure. Something, yeah. But I couldn't tell but, what it was. But he flips it in the air, lets it hit the table. He doesn't just catch it in his hand. Right. He lets it bounce on the table, and it bounces, and then all of a sudden it leads in, like lands on a completely separate picture. It like kind of rolls away a little bit. Yeah, and rolls, yeah. And there's a, like it rolls over to this folder, folder that um, Irene has pushed off to the side, and it lands on a picture of Dead Dog Farm, and Irene, Irene says. Well, hey, I thought I removed that picture. Because it's a, as she generously calls it, a fixer-upper. Yeah, slightly. It's, yeah, it's, it's a bad scene. It, it, it's yeah. basically been abandoned. And she, when they take it, uh, yeah. when she like, takes a look at it, she says, well, it's still standing probably yeah. by sheer force of will. <laughs> well, you know, and she basically mentions like, well, hey, there's some really bad stuff that went on there. You don't want yeah. this property. And he's yeah. like, he's like, Ooh, tell me more. Tell me about it. <laughs> like, tell like, me he put, more like, about he put, this like he puts both me. fists on his chin. He's like, tell me more. Tell me more about this property. That's probably worth 10 times more than I will have to pay for it. <laughs> I'm interested. <laughs> tell me about this future money pit, please. Yeah. yeah I mean, who wouldn't be interested? It's, you know, it's cheap property for, you know, yeah. So it's a nice piece of property. Even if it's a crappy house, exactly. <laughs> It is quite a good fixer-upper. So, so so they drive out to the house, and this is where she's talking about the legend. Right. Around, which you already kind of talked about. Mm -hmm. um, that only, the, you know, everybody else, the rest of us struggle with this. Right. And she says that nobody has looked at the property for the past year. So they and he's like, well, somebody's been here. There's three tracks. There's three car tracks here. Right. So because Cooper ever the detective. Because, because Cooper is like a ninja. Because Cooper is Batman, essentially. Yeah, pretty much. And uh, so the doors open, and it's it's kind of funny because at this point you would think Cooper would um, kind of push Irene back because like he doesn't know what to expect. Well, but, I think he's but, probably sure there's nobody there because there's no cars there. Okay, so he feels it's safe, is what you're saying. I think he thinks it's safe because he knows that whoever was there left because the cars are gone. If yeah. they had still been there, there still would have been a car because he knows there were three different cars. Yeah. And so he I, he's pretty sure they're not in any imminent danger. See, I'm kind of also wondering if he wanted Irene around as because a witness to what he was doing there. Maybe. Yeah. As, that's a, a, good as a corroborating witness. I don't think he's gotten that far yet, but, but still. I mean, I mean, but I mean good, maybe in, it's Cooper. He plans this stuff. So maybe he's thinking ahead going... <laughs> Maybe I, yeah. you know, like in case I come across something, I don't want to be, have it, you know, this cloud hanging over me to affect the No, the that's true. Yeah, he's, he's, he wants to keep he's it, not he in a position to keep right now to be up. taking a lot of risks. Exactly. So he's playing yeah. it by the book, essentially. And so they go in there. It uh, looks like there's been a meeting within the past few hours. Because there's, there's uh, cigarette butts in the ashtray. Right. And, and uh, baby laxative in the sink. That somebody baby. probably forgot didn't have any running water, so it's just sitting there. Are we sure Bobby wasn't there? Baby laxative. Baby laxative. Uh, Bobby killed a guy. Bobby killed a guy. So uh, so there's baby laxative in the sink, and, well, hey, because it's a party, cocaine's on the chair. Cocaine is on the chair, which Cooper, yep. even though he has turned in his badge and his gun, yeah. has not turned in his little baggies. Yes. Well, he's got <laughs> so he takes, bring he takes a baggie. sample of the cocaine. So he's got evidence, yeah. baggies, essentially. Yes, he's got evidence. And he, and he takes it back to Denise and says, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i bet you anything, this is going to match the cocaine you found planted in my car. Yeah. Because there was cocaine residue in Cooper's car that they planted on him to make him look even more guilty. Yeah. 
and we've 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 seen them talk about that they were going to do that. We know it was them. So Cooper's now on to it. So he's pretty sure that he's found out where the where the cocaine is. So now he's just got to figure out who's been at this farm. Yeah. And, and um, so we talked about Audrey already. Mm-hmm. And Ernie essentially is eating wings at double at the Double R Diner. Yeah. Who's your best bet? <laughs> for you know for getting somebody to roll on the group yeah i would think weasley ernie would be like candidate number one right there because ernie's got now he's got a good thing going he's got a number one answer a, yeah he's got a he's he's married he likes his wife his wife is kind of well to do he doesn't want to lose that gravy train yeah and he has a criminal record that they right. are aware of so denise comes in yeah exactly and basically threatens him with with going back to prison if he doesn't help them. Yeah, because she first she kind of comes up to him like, "Hey, I'm a woman coming on to you," and then yeah. and then bang slaps down the uh, her DEA badge. Yeah, his on the, the dossier on him too. Yeah. Like, hey, we know that you yeah. are you know for embezzlement and like securities fraud and all these other sort of. He's more of a a, a numbers type of a criminal. Right. You know, he's like a, he's like a shady accountant. Yeah, exa- gonna... ex- essentially. Yeah. Well, yeah, he's not a, uh, can't trust accountants. They're all shady. He's not, he's not, he's not any sort of like heroic, you know, I'm going down and, you know, top of the world, ma kind of no. criminal. No, he's no, not... he's not Scarface. To put it no, way. he is not going down. You know, he's, he's, he's going to turn. He, he, he's not Al Pacino in dog day afternoon. Let's just put it that way. No, heck no. Speaking of gender reassignment. <laughs> 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 yeah. <coughs> um. But, so yeah. So, so so they find Ernie, and they think he's probably going to be the best bet. He's, to, he's the uh, best guy to flip on, to um, infiltrate. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So, um. So he's all like, you know, like, hey, you know, you guys, what do I mean? like? I love my wife. Okay. You know, like, you know, these guys. I'm just, I'm just a coward. Okay. You know, I'm a coward. Don't make me do this. Yeah. <laughs> so so in the final episode, they get back to the sheriff's office. And Denise urges Ernie to make a phone call to Jean Renault. Jean Renault and say, hey, yeah. is what they're still trying to find somebody to buy yeah. that $125,000 worth of cocaine. Yeah. And, so, and, and Ernie, of course, is waffling on this. He's just like, yeah. well, I don't know. You know, you, you know, Jean, you know, Jean's a very dangerous guy or whatever. And Denise basically calls him out, says, well, you know, she Cooper comes in and and Denise says, "Well, you know, Ernie's a little gun shy." Yeah. Using that exact word. And uh-huh. Ernie's just like, "Well, what do you what what are you talking about? You know, gun shy, that's not me. Uh no, here, give me that phone. I'll take that. Here, I'll call him up right now." You know, trying to for whatever reason because like whatever perception he thinks that that Cooper cares about is important to him for some reason. Like, yeah, that, that whole, like, you know, that public perception matters more to him than his own cowardice, apparently. So, which is kind of, yeah, intru- exactly. which is kind of weird, but. You know. And that's the thing. He doesn't want to go to prison. And if they, you know, yeah. they have him for dealing with these guys and it's like, you know, they just, they sort of, and you know, Hank kind of bullied him into working with these guys because, you know, Hank knows him from prison. and So essentially he was a reluctant participant. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, he's very reluctant. But it, like he says, and you know, like he makes the deal, and then the next second after he hangs up the phone, he's like, but I'm a coward. He's like, don't make me do this. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> this so, is not my kind of thing. So they essentially, like, they leave it to Hawk to tape up this transmitter to Ern- <laughs> Ernie's abdomen. Yep. And Ernie is like, you know, he's Mr. Sweat, okay, at this point. Mm-hmm. You know, he's just, he's the, you know, he's all kinds of nervous. He's, unst- you know, like he's shaky. It's hyperhidrosis. It's a childhood condition. Yes. That's that's, what, that's what his explanation of his yep. excessive sweating as opposed mm-hmm. to just like, mm-hmm. like, no, I'm just being a complete chicken shit and I'm, and I'm freaking out right now. No, it can't be. It has to be, yeah. hi- has to be hyperhidrosis. Exactly. So, and he talks, and starts talking about his Korean War experiences. It's just like, you know. Yeah. Shut up, Ernie. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, so they run through the plan, 
And the plan is to take Denise to Dead Dog Farm to meet Jean Reno. Mm -hmm. And um, at this point, this is where Truman deputizes Cooper. Oh, okay. Yes. And he pins That's deputy right. badge number 13 on his number chest. Number 13. Yep. And um, this is this is after making him a bookhouse boy. Right. So, so, so yeah, essentially he's, he's part of the secret club. He's, he's part of, he's part of the Twin Peaks, you know, group of, uh, Mary bandits basically now. He's basically joined so. the Elks version, the Twin Peaks version of the Elks or the Moose. And no, uh, it's much, it's, it's much more secret society than the Elks, you know, know, they, know. they're because the, the bookhouse boys are like, even but though I, Harry is one of them, they're kind of like vigilantes. But my point is that Twin Peaks doesn't have like the Elks or the Moose. They would have to have that's a secret. True. Yeah, because it's Twin Peaks, yeah. they would have to have a secret society. That's, yeah, they don't. There's no like Twin Peaks Shriners Club or exactly, something. Exactly. It's nothing that normal. Is my point. No. Uh -uh. So, so at this point, Denise enters, but dressed as Dennis. Totally '90s douchebag outfit too, with like his hair slicked back, like kind of pulled in a ponytail. Right. And he, he is rocking the the uh, the ponytail, the bro, yeah. the brony tail, the pony knob, yeah, yeah. Oh, he's and he's so gross. <laughs> perfectly, perfectly looks like a like a like a drug dealer. So you thought you thought he looked hotter in, in women's clothes than than? Oh the... yeah, heck yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not not in that nineties douche outfit. That's that was funny. that was pretty terrible. Yeah, and so um, so they go to Dead Dog Farm. Got Trooper and, and Truman and Cooper uh, watching everything going on from the far back, you know, with binoculars because binoculars, bad, bad binoculars. Mm -hmm. And Hawk's listening in over the the radio through that wire that Ernie has on his chest. Mm -hmm. so, Which so it's comically, a, so it's essentially Twin Peaks version of the wire. Yeah, kind of, but it's sort of comic. You know, the the the. Uh the wire on Ernie sort of comically shorts out because right. he's sweating too much. Right. Exactly. Because he's sweating like a pig. Yeah. But... They start commenting. I was like, why is this guy so sweaty? He's like, Oh, it's hyperhidrosis. Do you know your shirt is smoking? And then the shirt starts smoking because it's, it's shorting out on him. Right. right. So that's and totally, like, he's that heard totally... a wire. And so then they, yeah. Jig is up. The jig is up. So they take Ernie and Dennis as hostages. Right. And, so so Hawk tells Cooper that and Truman that the wire's dead and then they they basically um uh Jean and uh Mountie King yep come out and say that um you know like we're going to make a deal or you know like you know like I'm going to use these two as hostages basically using them as human shields mm -hmm. essentially and Cooper offers himself up as trade like That's the like, thing. Like I'm the one you want. Take me. Let them go. Yeah, let them go, and I'll come in there, and we'll we'll deal with this. Right. Which is, you know, because Jean Reno is who Cooper wants in the first place. Right. And, and it's totally in character for Cooper to just give himself up like that. Oh, it's totally in character for Cooper to just give himself up like that. So, you know, there there's a standoff that lasts like you know hours, and. uh so they're trying to figure out it's 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 Cooper, Jean Reno, and Mountie King are still left in the house. And they're trying to figure out, you know, how to how to get out of this. And, you know, he's like he's like, what are they just gonna let us go? He's like, Yeah, if you surrender. And he's like, Well, <laughs> you know. Well, if you notice they rough up Cooper a bit. They do rough him up a little bit. And... We we see that some time passes. Basically it goes from the the afternoon into the evening. And, yeah. um, so, and it's kind of here, um, where Jean, like, I guess Cooper asked, basically asked Jean, like, okay, what's the deal? Why are you so pissed at me? Mm -hmm. and He's like, well, <laughs> because of you, my brothers are dead. <laughs> I had two brothers before you and now they're gone. They're dead. Yeah. He said, he said, Twin Peaks used to be a simple place. <laughs> Then Pretty Girl gets murdered. Then Cooper. <laughs> and then you show up. And my brothers are dead. And he's like, yeah. Uh, he's like, yeah, I know that somebody else killed Jacques, but it's because you were here that this right. happened. I blame you. 
Uh, he blames he blames Cooper. So he says, he says, well, you know, should we give ourselves up or should we kill Cooper first? And Cooper's like, well, then you'll both die. He's like, that's fine with me. He's like, do, do you, does my death mean that much to you? Is it that important? Right. He's like, yeah, kind of. <laughs> you would think Mountie King at this point would be going, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I didn't decide I don't want to be part of this nut job situation it, any more than I look, have to be. Look, you want to be on this whole suicidal, like, kamikaze thing. You go right uh-huh. ahead, but leave me out of it. Mm-hmm. I didn't sign up for this. Nope. <laughs> but nope, nope, he keeps his mouth shut. And um, okay. because, hey, he's an expendable character. And um, so, yeah, he says that, uh, yeah, he's basically you like, you, know, you threw everything into this nightmare state. And, you know, like, maybe if you die, like, maybe the nightmare will die with you. Maybe the nightmare will die with you, yep. Which is a pretty interesting line coming from John. And then... And then- um, and then, now the um, king says, wait a minute, did you guys order food? Yeah, exactly. So th- at this point, here's where things get interesting. Because it looks like there's a double R waitress coming up to deliver food. Yeah, which is, you know, kind of a normal thing in a standoff. But you know, everybody you gotta It's not Norma. It's not Shelly. It's, it's not it's not Heidi. It's not Heidi because she's Annie's too busy. Not in town she's yet. too busy, you know, like jump starting the old man. She's got knockwurst to make. So, so who is it? Yeah, who's the, it? Is Denise Bryson? Denise Bryson. So, yep. so quick as a flash, uh, you know, uh, Dennis changes back into Denise and right. uh, swings by the double R for some fashion uh, ensemble, mm-hmm. and uh, pulls it. Basically, goes in uh, to try to secretly. Um, Rescue Cooper. That's the plan, presumably. Right. Right. So they go in there with it. She goes in there with a tray of food. Uh, and John doesn't recognize her. Interesting. Yeah. Decides to let her in. Now, it is darker. So maybe he didn't get a good look at her face. It is dark. All maybe, she has. To... Maybe she. Maybe John was too busy looking at those pretty legs of his. Well, that's what she does. She gets all flirty. Right. And, you know, starts to show her legs. Right. And she's got a gun yeah. in her stockings. Yeah. So, so yeah, not, not like the ankle It's more up by the garter or the, um, yeah, she's got, she's got thigh high stockings on yeah. that are attached by a garter. And so right. stuck in there is a gun. It's like, it's like a little 20, little 22, like revolver. Right. And like, so a, she's hoping that Cooper will see that, which he does grabs it from her and shoots Jean Renault. And as he tries to get away, like, like basically, yeah, because John tries to get away, but Cooper shoots him. Cooper shoots him. The tray goes flying. He comes back stumbling out going, argh, you got me. Yeah. And she, Denise grabs uh, Mountie King. Yeah. And uh, then everybody storms in and Mountie King. Come here, Francine. Come here, Francine. Come here. What do we do? (laughs) Stop that. (laughs) So. Sorry, I just I sent you down that rabbit hole, didn't I? Yeah, I'll, I could do that entire pre-credits bit if you wanted me to. Anyway, right. so everybody comes in, and Mountie King is probably going to go away for quite a while for this. Because not only did he try to set up a federal agent, he's also running drugs across the border. <laughs> <laughs> Outside of his jurisdiction. Because, because apparently all the Canadians run drugs across the border in this show. Yeah, that's apparently what they do. So, um, oh, you know, we forgot to mention yeah. that it's just Ernie and uh, Mountie King and John Renault because Hank right. is in the hospital. Yes. Because Nadine beat the crap out of it. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Hank and, well, Norma and, uh, and Ed were at Ed's house. Yeah. You should, but you should having, go, yeah, go ahead and do that. Have, you know, they, they were, they were, uh, they, they stole some time together. We'll just yeah. say that. Yeah. And when it was over and Norma Lee, well, you they know. All, and, they all kind of end up in bed together. All three of them. Not at that point. That's oh, later. Oh, that, is that later? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's later. Okay. that's later. I knew it was coming up, but yeah. So the, so Hank, she says she's got to run some errands. He's like, wait, we still have the breakfast crowd. Where the hell are you going? 
So he follows her. So he knows she's been with Ed. So Hank is there and he's like, so he, he, you know, clocks Ed on the jaw, punches him out. And then lights out Mr. Monkey Wrench. What's up, Mr. Monkey Wrench? So he's trying to, you know, he's, he's, he thinks he's going to beat the crap out of Ed. Yeah. But Nadine comes home. Yep. And loses her shit. Loses her shit. And first she comes at Hank with her backpack and then she just wails on him. Right. Just totally, totally takes him down. And um, so later on. Beats the dominoes right out of him. Beats the dominoes right out of him. So later on, he tells. I think he tells the police that he was hit by a bus. <laughs> yes. And then he tells he tells Norma right. that a tree fell on him. So he's like. <laughs> He's like doing everything. A little, he little can. conflicting stories there. Yeah, he's doing everything he can except say that Nadine beat the beat the living right, snot. Right, because he's totally embarrassed by it. Yes. Yeah. So he's yeah. So he's in the hospital, but because that they because they know that he's in on this thanks to Ernie and the photos. Yeah, he's busted. His parole is basically violated here. Yeah, and because they know from Shelley and Bobby. Right. They know mostly from Bobby that that's who tried to kill Leo. Yes. They've got him on attempted murder charges for Leo as well. So, yeah, he's going to jail for a long time after this. So guess who's going back to prison? Guess who's going to prison? Prison. <laughs> so, yeah. Dental plan. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Do not start me on that. I don't don't. As even. soon as that came out of my mouth, I'm like, "Oh, you idiot! You should have." Yeah, that's you just, that you is just, five that's minutes. Like, that's like opening the Pandora's box right there. <laughs> that is five minutes of Lisa needs braces. That old <laughs> man. Anyway, um, so yeah, Hank Hank is out for the count, which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So finally, Hank gets taken off the board. So yeah, Hank's out, and. uh I wonder what ha- what what happens to Ernie? Does Ernie just leave town and go back? Um, no, here's okay. So here, so here's the deal. Okay, so um, so that's kind of where we kind of leave off with Ernie. Although, yeah. as we find out in um, Twin Peaks, the final dossier, right? Okay, so in exchange for his cooperation in the investigation, you know, because he was willing to wear a wire or whatnot, he gets cleared of any wrongdoing. So he's basically scot free. They worked yeah. the deal. He worked the deal. He goes back to Seattle, finds that Vivian had moved out and filed for divorce. Bah, 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 bah. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So after that, Ernie ends up reverting back to a life of crime because, hey, it's Ernie. And he ends up in bankruptcy, poverty, uh, poverty, and alcoholism. Ah. Uh, so Ernie Niles, this one's for you. There you go. Awesome. <laughs> Couldn't happen yeah. to a nicer guy. Couldn't happen to a nicer guy. So yeah. yeah, we never really find out what happened to Mountie King, do we? No, we don't know a, a thing what happened to him. Presumably, you know, you know, we figure. Well, we know that Co- we know that Co- this problem exactly. So we know um, later, um, five episodes later after this one, uh, Gordon Cole returns from Bend, Oregon. And reinstates Cooper into the Federal Bureau of Investigation. So they take That's another right. five episodes just to get Cooper back in the FBI. Right. Well, it's, and and this uh, is and this is where Cooper gets his Smith and Wesson ten millimeter model ten seventy six. So rather special. So yeah. So Cooper. Cooper is a. Uh, you know he's 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 exonerated himself and he's been cleared of any criminal wrongdoing. So presumably, Mountie King was busted. This I'm, I'm assuming he was if, busted, if Cooper yeah. was cleared that means Mountie King was incriminated presumably. yeah exactly exactly so so Cooper's all right except there's still two Somebody, big problems somebody's going down for this yeah there's still two big problems going on in Twin Peaks which are first of all Cooper's starting to get mail from uh Wyndham Earl which is a problem right and we still haven't figured out who shot me Right. Yeah. So. Fibers from a vacuna coat. 
Yeah, oh, which, you know, had to go to the cleaners at some point. This is true. <laughs> That's very, very true. Yep. So, uh, so yeah. So, lots of other stuff going on with all this. Yes. But uh, that's basically the dead dog farm saga. Which I have to say. Yeah, it's it's very short. I mean, they get in, they get out. Not like with the James Hurley saga, which felt like it was dragging on forever because we were doled out so sparingly here, there, and then along the way. Exactly. Exactly. This one's. Boom, in and out, main, you know, they get it done and they start driving into the uh, Wyndham Earl storyline. Exactly, exactly. Because the Wyndham Earl starts, Wyndham Earl starts coming in right. during that. Yeah, they, they, tease, and, they tease him and then they kick things into overdrive. Then they kick it into overdrive, especially because, after... Because, it, well, because at the end of this episode, after they come back from Dead Dog Farm, that's when they come back to Harry's office and they find that the lights are out. And, yeah. and Wyndham Earl leaves them a little present in the form of a dead body tied to a chair pointing to a chessboard. A dead transient yes. pointing to a spot on the chessboard. Yeah, exactly. The, the Wyndham Earl's next move. Yep. Or, or opening move, I should say. Mm -hmm. So he... So yeah, Cooper, Cooper is definitely staying in town for a while. He might as well right. buy that house, frankly. Um, but what I like about the dead dog farm storyline is to me, it's totally worth it for Denise Bryson. Yeah. I love that character. Well, I love David Duchovny. So it was totally, totally, totally worth it. Well, you know, when Denise became such a fan favorite of Twin Peaks. Yeah. So, and you know, obviously David Lynch thought so too, because he, you know, he asked David to come. The company to come back for Twin Peaks: The Return and reprise mm -hmm. Denise, knowing that fans liked Denise, and um, which he did, and I was so happy that yeah, happened. And it was really great that Duchovny, even after his big career in the X Files and doing other stuff, was willing mm -hmm. to come back and do that. Yeah, I thought it was. I thought it was fantastic. So, so. Credit, credit to Duchovny for doing that. Oh heck yeah! But yeah, the fact because that he didn't, it, have, he didn't have to do it, he could have just said no and turned it down, but he didn't. Yeah, because this is this is a bit character that was in what four episodes exactly. I mean, it's not that not that big of a thing, but yeah, definitely a fan favorite. Right. They, um, could have, they could have obviously written a different character in that place, but mm -hmm. Duchovny was willing to do they, it, so I got to give him points for that. I I do too. I think it was great, and and looking back on it now, yeah, the fact that it only took four episodes for Cooper to be okay right. is great. Right. That's what I'm <laughs> saying. This this storyline is very nice and tidy. Yeah. You know, it it get it does its thing, you know, it just it doesn't drag on forever. Nope. And so so as a result, I think it's much more effective than obviously the James Hurley saga. Well, in the James Hurley saga too, it's like that doesn't Well, and you also it also helped that you had characters that you cared about more. I, and that's the thing, is you I cared, cared about, about you cared about what happened to Cooper. You cared about, you know, like is Jean Renault gonna get finally taken down? Yeah, you wanna know what's gonna happen to Jean Renault. You want bad things to happen to Hank Jennings. Exactly. You care about Cooper. Now, I care about James, too. But at the same time, the end of Dead Dog Farm has a payoff that's that's great. You know, the, the bad guys get their comeuppance. Yeah. And Cooper's okay. There's a resolution. The, there's closure. Yeah. But at the end of the James Hurley saga, James is okay, but he, but he drives off into the sunset and is James yeah. is... Well, James is not okay. James doesn't go to jail, but he's still not okay. He's well, still no, very he's tortured. A, well, we, as we find out from Twin Peaks to the final dossier, he becomes an exile, essentially. Yeah, and that's that's the thing. So he lives, it's, in, no, lives in exile, and he's trying, basically, has to struggle to stay out of jail. It would be one thing if, you know, this whole situation with Evelyn had brought him back home to Donna and he tried to figure out, you know, you know, he, he recognized the good things in his life and he tried to figure out how to, you know, put things back together and where to go from here, something like that. Or if he'd had, if it had given him some sort of purpose, but it really wasn't much of a good payoff. Plus I didn't know Evelyn and what's his name. So I didn't care what happened to them. Like I didn't care if they went to jail or not, or, you know, and then the, I wasn't even all that upset when they, when, um, Malcolm, you're talking about. 
Yeah. Yeah. And when the husband died, it's like I'd seen him for like, you know, five minutes. I yeah, he was, yeah, he was only in one episode. How invested could you be in his character? You're not necessarily inv- – so even though he was an abusive husband, and, you know, believe me, I love to see and, abusive and, husbands and, die. And, and we never actually but, got to see evidence, physical evidence of that. We just yeah. – we're going by what we heard. Exactly. So it's not like – you know, I didn't care enough about him to feel – super excited about the fact that he was that he was dead or anything like that so it just it wasn't as much of a payoff as right. this was right so but yeah this one gets in gets out and you get closure with it so that's good mm-hmm. all right exactly all right anything else about the storyline you want to talk about um no the only other thing i wanted to mention was uh gavin O'Hurley. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that was I was going to do some trivia bit. So go ahead, you you can do that one. Gavin O'Hurley, who yeah. played Mounty Mounty King, right? Yeah. Who I'm sure everybody Preston, recognizes. Preston King. That's his first huh? name. Preston is his first name. Preston. Yeah, I just like saying Mounty. Mounty's funnier. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I love the Mounties. They're the they're, they're uh, they're the most fashionable right. of the. Uh, they look so dapper in those red uniforms. Of the federal of the federal uh, police. Departments in right. across the world. Right. So the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Officer. Preston yep. King. Yes. So, um, I'm sure most of you know most people our age remember him as Brad from Superman Three. Right. Or uh, or as Jack, Jack Patashi. Jack Tashi from uh, from um, Never Say Never Again. Right. Where. Uh, right. This is this is this is what heroin's going to do to you, kids. If you're so addicted <laughs> to heroin that you are willing. To have an eye transplant. Right, exactly. So that you can... To, go to help into... Spectre steal nuclear warheads. Yes. That's, an that's commi- eyeball transplant. Well, that's commitment. That, that eyeball transplant. Did you hear what I just said? <laughs> yes, I know. That's commitment. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> that is... Yeah, that's pretty bad. Yeah. So... So, um, yeah, and so, obviously, son of Dan O'Hare, he... Who is Andrew Packard. Exactly. So, keeping like, it all in the Twin Peaks family here. Yeah, so we've got father and son acting in the same show with no scenes together, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? That's kind of cool. You think they would have at least one scene together? Yeah, you would think that they would just like cross paths at the double R or something. So, like or that. yeah, or at uh, Great Northern or something that just yeah. Right, right, exactly. But so nope, nope, not not at all. Now there was a, one other trivia bit I want to talk about. Okay. Uh, so Agent Roger Hardy. Uh huh. Is played by Clarence Williams the Third. Link Hayes, baby. You got it. You can so best known as Link Hayes in the TV series The Mod Squad, mm-hmm. which also starred. I think that was Peggy Lipton. I think you're absolutely right. Mm-hmm. So, exactly. Yeah, so, so, nice little... so essentially, Norma was in the Mod Squad with Roger Hardy. Mm-hmm. Yep. And the candlestick. Anyway. And he, you know what else he was in? What? He's Prince's father in Purple Rain. You're absolutely right about that, too. Mm-hmm. Good call. I forgot about yeah. that. So, yeah. So, cool. That's, but, very, uh, that's very cool. So, yeah. Again, so, we have, like, this Mod Squad reunion that doesn't actually happen. No, <laughs> no. Because, yeah. Well, no, no. They, they did have, they, I mean, we, there's there was a scene where Hardy's in the double R. And I think Norma takes his order or something. Something like that, but it's, but it's, it's very, really, it's uh, really, it's really brief, but I think they yeah. do share one scene together. But there's no like nod to anything or no, anything. No, no, like it's that, not, so. no in joke references. Yeah, it's just, it's just there. We have this mod squad. Uh, yeah. We have this mod squad reunion. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This unofficial mod squad reunion. Mm hmm. So yeah. Yep. But I just thought it was kind of cool. So I thought I'd mention it. That is very cool. All right. Yep. So, uh, let's see. So, uh, if you don't have anything else, what's your rating for this one? My rating for this one is eight out of 10 bookhouse boy patches. You're very, you're like, we're dead on. I gave it eight out of 10 surrendered FBI badges. Oh, nice. I was going to do that one. Or if you took that one, I was going to go with smoking chest microphones. That's a good one too. Yeah. Smoking sweaty chest microphones. Sweaty, yeah, sweaty exactly. chest microphones. Yeah. So, yeah, like I said, I, yeah, I. But yeah, it's a good solid eight from both. It of is. Us. This, this is a storyline that doesn't really take a lot of time, so it's it's 
not terribly necessary to the plot of Twin Peaks, but like I said, it 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 gains a lot for introducing Denise Bryson to us. Yeah, you you mentioned this earlier, but it's a great transitional storyline. Yeah, it's it's a it's a good reason to keep Cooper in town so that he can deal with the Wyndham Earl threat. Because that's the thing is that Wyndham Earl has taken a while to find Cooper, and if he just flew back to Philadelphia, that, that would have been kind of funny. It's like, okay, so so Wyndham Earl just arrives in town. Like he's in his little just, cabin, just too late after Cooper had already gone back to Philadelphia. Yeah, and he's like, "Wait, Cooper? What? Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> he was just so, here. Yeah, I he was. Just, how did I miss him? What the hell? So it's a good, yeah, it's a good way to keep Cooper in town, and you know the kind of the cool thing is that some of the the goofier storylines in these four episodes, they yeah. kind of peter out when we start getting into the Wyndham Earl saga. Right. Because other people start getting involved in the Wyndham Earl saga. Yeah. The Wyndham Earl saga got... does a good job of incorporating a lot of the cast into it. Right. We've got the three young women who all get the poem. Exactly. Like, Leo's that... involved. You've got, um, you know, just Wyndham Earl comes across, like encounters various people along the way. He, cause he's, he just shows up, he all shows the time up in disguise in a lot of places. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it kind of brings them into the main orbit. Yeah. He brings everybody into the main orbit and even, even Doc Hayward, he brings in by posing as his right. dead college friend. And so and more then, and more. And then when be- they have the Miss Tween Peaks contest, a lot Miss of Tween the cast contest. are involved in that, but so is Wyndham Earl because that's his main target. Exactly. To get the queen. So that's right. So that's, right. what's going to happen there. And then we have, um, you know, we have the goofy Dougie Milford marrying Lana. Right. Which turns into the Dwayne Milford. And almost Lana. Married, yeah. you know, getting with Lana. Right. Which is which is very goofy, but has a little bit more of a point because he is a judge at the Miss Twin Peaks contest and she wants to win the Miss Twin Peaks contest. Yes. So and you obviously expecting him to vote for her, yes. Right. I will say I do I do love the Milford wedding. I think that's hilarious. <laughs> that was... Where they're all like, I love Milford weddings. Like 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 they obviously <laughs> have all been to one like eight times. Right, exactly. Because they happen so frequently. It's like well as exactly. they explain that it was like, you know, it's part, like the seasonal change thing. Yeah, they yeah, they his weddings are seasonal. Like the like the salmon spawn in the spring or whatever, and so do uh, <laughs> Milford weddings happen at the same the time. <laughs> yeah. And uh that's there's funny. a scene where the log lady goes up to uh, Pete Martell and just says, this cake is delicious. <laughs> and he's just sort of looking at her like, what the hell lady? And I always get a kick out of it when the two of them are on se- on screen together. Right. Um, Maybe you should wash that down with a nice glass of milk. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, like in the last episode where he thinks that she stole his truck. Yeah. He's just, lady like, stole my truck. He's just he's just looking at her all suspicious and yeah. stuff, but I think it's and and, um, and they have to reassure him. No, Pete, the log lady did not steal your no, truck. Wyndham Earl stole your truck. So he um, even then, I don't think Pete was sold on it. Yeah, I don't think I, Pete was. Sold I'm still he's it, like all shifty eyes looking at, at the log like, lady because Pete knows what he saw. By God, exactly. he saw the log lady steal his truck. Um, he trusts his uh, own eyes. Yeah, does uh. But again, just be, because they have been working with David Lynch the entire time David Lynch has been making films, and because they were formerly husband and wife, I always I always get a kick out of the fact that they were when they get a right. scene together. So that's good because I you know I love the fact that they were husband and wife, but they still they still work well together. I think right. I mean, some, just, sometimes you know, obviously there's that strain because you can't mm-hmm. stand to be around that person emotionally. Well, sometimes you just can't be married to somebody. Exactly. You're fine with them as a but, person. But, you can't but be sometimes, you know, the, the divorces happen and people still remain friends, which is good. Mm-hmm. That's the healthy yeah, way. That's to the do thing. It. It's like because the one thing that made you not like each other was being married to each other. Exactly. So, it, but yeah, otherwise, they get along great. So. Yeah, that's the thing. If you don't have to, if you don't have to be partners with somebody anymore, you can yeah. be friendly with them. Exactly. So, some people work better as friends than as, but, uh, as lovers or whatever. So, yeah. So does does Hank does Hank I'm trying to remember does Hank ever get tr- does he ever get a, you know prosecuted for setting the mill fire? I don't know. 
because we were there's a. I can't um, remember. I don't think so. When Catherine Martell at least, goes on, to, at least not on screen. Yeah, when Catherine Martell goes to see Benjamin Horn, mm-hmm. she talks about you know getting a phone call in a voice she didn't recognize. I was like, oh yeah, that was Hank that called her. Maybe the only thing I can think of is that maybe when Harry's filling in, like as kind of a um, aftermath about what happened to Hank, he says, well, you, uh-huh. know, you know, Hank violated his parole and then they brought him up on charges for this and this and this or whatever. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. It's yeah, possible. but it sounds like it sounds like the only people who know about that are Ben Horn and uh, uh, Hank Jennings. So. I don't know. Maybe Ben Horn in an act of revenge told the cops. Well, Catherine, had, I don't you yeah, know. Catherine had to know about it. Catherine didn't. She said it was a voice she didn't recognize. I don't think she knew who Hank was. Oh, that's true. But so, couldn't Shelley have identified who did it? I, I don't know. That's a good question. I would think Shelley could have identified Hank. She might have been able to, but, you know, because, yeah, Hank is who shot Leo through the window, but she was her back was to the window at the time. Right. She might have just been so terrified from being tied up. Well, we'll find know. it. We'll find out eventually when we start white rewatching some of these episodes. Yeah, we'll see. But, see what happens. All right. Um, so actually, I have some feedback this week. Sweet. Yeah. So I've barely thankful. been on social it's, media. I haven't seen anything. It's been a while, but we got some email to the Gmail. Some email. Email to the Gmail. So uh, Jeff F from Minnesota writes in. I know Jeff's full name because uh, Google sent it to me. But, uh, nice, but he didn't put that in in, in the sign. Well, we're not gonna we're not gonna so I'm, I'm not gonna, yeah, I'm not, exactly. want to yeah, we'll keep that uh, under wraps. So yep. if, if he would have done, if he wanted to include that, he would have put it in the body of his letter. So I'm gonna leave yes, it. he would have. So I'll, I'll protect the secret identity for now. All right. So he says, Jeff writes in, "Hey, Ghostwood, huge Twin Peaks fan that stumbled onto your podcast. Love the show." Just listening to the James Hurley saga, so much better than actually watching it. It's oh, rough. thank you, Jeff. It's we rough. were hoping that yeah. you would consider that a uh, public service like yeah, we did. Exactly. This is, this is our gift to you. Yes, this we, is our gift to you. We watched it so you didn't have to. We watched it so you didn't have to, yep. Exactly. So uh, he says, can't wait to hear more and to dig into the back catalog. Please keep it up. Best, Jeff F. from Minnesota. Thank you, Jeff. That's thank our you, plan. Thank so you, thanks. Jeff. I'm glad you found us. I'm glad you're here. So thank you, Jeff. With three Fs. Jeff, Jeff with three Fs. <laughs> <laughs> we really, no, seriously, we really do appreciate you, Jeff. And thank you so much for writing in and letting us know that we're actually doing a good, good job. We really appreciate it. Yes, we, we definitely appreciate it's it. It's always so great to hear you. feedback and uh, especially when we get fo- positive feedback. So that's always definitely. good to hear. So Definitely. It's like, hey, we're not completely sucking at this. That's great. Yay. Uh, and it's just nice to know that there are nerds out there like us who love the show as much as we do. Right. And at least some of those that are appreciated us summing up the James Hurley saga. Yes. yes. I, thought that, I thought that would be an appreciated That's the major selling observation. point, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So nice to know we're getting some points for that. Um, so if you want to be like Jeff, and uh, please do. Please write in. Let us know what you think. And uh, anything else about any upcoming storylines we're going to talk about, uh, or just whatever Twin Peaks general um, thoughts come into your brain, you can drop us a line like Jeff did at ghostwoodpodcast at gmail.com at the gmail, ghostwoodpodcast at gmail.com, or you can reach us on the Twitter machine at ghostwoodcast. Definitely appreciate that. Yes, definitely. On our Facebook page, Ghostwood the Twin Peaks Podcast. You can drop us a line there as well. Many people have. We're all over the place. We are all over the place. So it's not like you don't have the ability to reach us, is what we're we're trying to say here. So please please reach out to us. We definitely appreciate it because we we want to know what you guys think and uh, how we're doing and stuff you'd like to talk about, about Twin Peaks. So let us know. Yeah, because Charles and I could talk about Twin Peaks all the time. Right. It's easier if we know what you guys want us to talk about. Right. So if there's something we're not covering that you want us to cover, well, drop us a line and let us know, right? Heck okay. yes. There's a good, there's an idea. All right. Um, so next time on Ghostwood, what are we going to talk about next time? 
I think. Do you want to do Major talk- Briggs's disappearance, or do you want to do Ben, or? I think we should talk about Josie. You want to talk about Josie? Okay, cool. I'll talk about Josie. I'm wondering if we should talk about that and then, uh, because I want to do that final episode with you. So do you want to make this like a two-parter where we talk about leading up to Josie? Or I don't know, we'll have to see how much time that fills up. Like the final, final episode? Well, you know, like Josie's final episode. Oh, Josie's final episode. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Well, this is, so my my point is that like, I know there was some stuff leading up to that. Yeah. Let's talk about what's going on. So do you want to kind of like, maybe we'll talk about it for a little bit. And then we'll watch the episode. Well, yeah, that's the thing. We can sort of back up and sort of re revisit Josie's bad planning. Okay. You know, and how she gets, you know, how Catherine Martell finds her out and how she becomes Catherine's maid and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So maybe that'll take an episode and then we could do uh, her final episode after that. Or we can do it all together. It's not long. Oh, I mean, oh, just, oh, okay, just, okay. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. I was trying to figure out. No, if, just sort of say, okay, here's. See, this is know, the kind of stuff we should have probably talked about off the air, but uh, you know, we're, you know, we're producing on the fly, so back. you know, we're being transparent here. You're a part of the process, right? But yeah, we'll 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 sort of summarize how Josie got to where she is right now and how she got so desperate. Okay, that's cool. And, and, then, um, we'll talk, and then we'll just uh, run through the episode. And then we can just sort of run through like we normally do. Eckhart coming to town and yeah. Andrew still being alive. And because I, I kind of would like to really watch that episode, the final, because I know that was your gateway episode. Yeah, that was my the first episode I saw. So that's so I kind of want to like, you know, want to watch that through with you like we've been doing before, when we did the Laura Palmer saga. Yes, exactly. Well, imagine yeah. having that be your first episode. <laughs> I know. And then, you know. Oh, great. I love this. Now it's canceled. Thanks a lot. Yes. For that. So. <laughs> I was very happy when it came back. Yeah. So. Well, as was I, because yep. Yep. I was by really invested in the show by that point. So heck yes. yeah, exactly. So, but yeah, what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about you know Josie's backstory, and then we'll do the episode. That sounds great. So, okay. so, so we're gonna have a big Josie episode next time. Yep. All right. This is the Josie episode. Yeah, this is the Josie. Because episode. honestly. I I think I was the most disappointed in the fact that there was no Josie anything in the return. Right. And we, you know, Bob asked the question, what happened to Josie? We don't know what happened to Josie. We have no idea. Yeah. So, let's see here. That was the, the Condemned Woman is the episode I'm trying to think of. The Condemned Woman, yes. So, so we're, yeah, so next time on... on Ghost We're going to talk the condemned woman, and but we'll also recap what happened up to that point. And up then, to that and, point, and then yes. we'll then we'll talk about it. So exactly. So we'll set it. We'll set the table, and then we'll have a nice little court, main course. Which, which means we get to talk about David Warner, which makes me so happy. Right, because hey, Thomas Eckhart, major player. Mm-hmm. So this is we finally get to talk David Warner. Yes. This is good. Yes. Speaking He's of, not even much, but it, it it's it counts. Speaking of, speaking of David Warner, did you hear that they're doing a Time Bandits TV series? I heard something about that, but that's in what? development. Yeah, Time Bandits TV series. And Interesting. Taikika Watiti, I forget that's how his name is. The guy who directed um, Thor Ragnarok. Oh, okay. Is involved apparently. Who's going to be in it? I don't know. I don't think they've cast yet. Oh, that'll be interesting. It's just very, they just announced it recently. So I'm, that, so might want to keep an eyeball out on that one. Yeah. Hmm. Or two. I wonder how that's going to, really, that has a lot, Time Bandits has a lot of heavy hitters in it. I know. So, you know? The, so this could either be like a reinvention or expansion. I don't know how they're going to do this. Like who's going to be King Agamemnon? I don't know. That'll be interesting. Hmm. Some really, if, I hope they do it right. I hope they do it justice. Yeah, seriously. I mean, are, you know, like are the, are the, the actual time bandits, are they still going to be little people or are they going to be, um, you know, full sized or, or what? How's that going to work? Yeah, are they going to be little people or are they going to not be or is it just going to be a whole different kind of crew of guys or is it going to be females? I don't know. Yeah, so. 
mean, that'll be it's going to be, really, be really interesting to see what they do with this. But yeah, just, just something I thought I'd bring up because you mentioned David Warner, and of course, David Warner was in Time Bandits. Oh, my absolute favorite devil on yes. film of all time. Right, you know, evil. De Niro is pretty He's, good. Is evil. De Niro's pretty good, but but uh, David Warner's Devil is pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. My favorite line in Time Bandits is a David Warner line. Which is? Where he's talking about how, you know, he's better than God because he's more, he understands technology and he's, <laughs> you know, he understands, you know, the, what's going on in the here and now. And, and, uh, and he says, but him, what does he do with his time? 44 species of parrot. I ask you. I love that. <laughs> 44 species of parrot, I ask you. It's been a long time since I watched that movie. I need to watch that. Yeah, I haven't watched it in years. It's, it's no one seems so, to broadcast it, so I never get to watch it. It's an it's another one, too. Like, I might have you to know, stream that. Again, I still don't think 30-year-old movies have spoiler alerts, but whatever. Yeah. Um, it's another one, too, like like uh, Holy Grail that just ends. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Just something terrible happens and the movie's just over. <laughs> well, I think that happens a lot with Terry Gilliam films. They just end. Yeah, yeah, it kind of does. Well, Brazil though has an ending. That's you know, true. it's yeah. a it's a depressing ending. But it's an ending. But it, you know, yeah, the Holy Grail just cuts, and yeah, the whole the Holy Grail is just kind of ridiculous. Yeah. How it just it just stops because <laughs> well because the film snaps and supposedly that's the end. Right. Well, they're, it's like they're getting arrested. By yeah, exactly. And the cameraman yeah. gets, you know, brought in. And so so they stop filming. Yeah. yeah abruptly. Yeah, exactly. All right. Yeah, it's totally, totally ridiculous. OK, so next and time this one's like the kid is just left out in the middle of the street. Yeah. With no parents, no house. See ya. <laughs> yep. Sucks to be you. Bye. The end. See you later. So. Yeah. But, but, but uh, like yeah, house. have you seen my time bandits map? You have the map. I have the map. Yes. Um, Give me the map. It looks like an old. It, it looks like an old nautical star map. Yeah. So I have it in my house, like framed and looking all classy. Oh, cool. <laughs> it's a small version of it, but yeah, it's framed and it looks all classy. Yeah. And uh, so cool. it probably just looks like I'm into like you know astronomy nautical or history. Or astronomy. Yeah. But yeah, it's a time. It's a time banana map. That's, that's very cool. That's very <laughs> awesome. Um, I have to check that out next time. I'm yeah, next time you're here. Seriously, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so, uh, in the meantime, if you want to, uh, we talked about how you can reach us here at Ghostwood. So, Zan, where can they reach you on the interwebs? I am on the Twitters and on the Instagrams as Udinax19. Yes. And I'm on the Facebook as Zan Sprouse, but I'm kind of not on there that much. Okay. And uh, you seem to be on but, there more than Twitter. I, yeah, because I well, Twitter just. I don't know. I'm on Facebook more because that's where my events, that's where I get events yeah, and stuff. Right. So, um, my Twitter is also a little bit more personal, so it might be more boring for people. Um, I'm never bored. And, uh, well, you're not a stranger. Oh, okay. I hope, um, I hope not. But I, but I'm also lurking around on the Ghostwood Facebook page. I go there. Excellent. I go there a lot. I just posted something the other day. What was it I posted? Uh, you put, well, oh, the, uh, Bob's Burgers thing. Yes, the Bob's Burgers thing. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> that was amazing when I said it. It was a Bob's Burgers Twin Peaks mashup. Yes, the Bob's Burgers Twin Peaks mashup. I was like, this is awesome. Yeah. I just yeah. posted a thing about, uh, Amazon's got a Twin Peaks store now. Oh, yeah, I saw that. So I posted, I posted the link for that. I they had a, probably they had, check that out. They, but... had a, they had an Audrey shirt. Yeah, I know. I've seen those. The one that she's got, like, talking about if, you know, algebra. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that one. Yep. All right. Um, so, as for me, you can reach me on the Facebook or at Charles Skaggs in Hilliard, Ohio, or uh, at Charles Skaggs on the Twitter machine or at Charles Skaggs on the Instagram or my blog at Geeky Things. Damn. Damn good coffee in the hot, where I talk about all the stuff we talk about here on Ghostwood and kind of David Lynch stuff or news of my other podcasts, like say, or your review of Captain Marvel, maybe my review of Captain Marvel, which hopefully I'm going to get finally finished tomorrow. <laughs> it's been taking I like work has been dogging me, so I haven't been able to sneak away. And I hear you. Oh stuff. yeah, 
Yeah. So I'm trying to get this done. It's a battle going on, but I'm almost finished. Um, so hopefully tomorrow. So hopefully I'll have a review of Captain Marvel. Um, spoilers, I liked it. So right there. Uh, news of my other podcast, like say Titan Talk, the Titans podcast, where currently Jesse Jackson and I are reviewing Doom Patrol, which is mm. an outstanding entry by DC Universe. Definitely, was it good? It's a huge step in quality up from Titans. And if you're a Twin Peaks fan and you love weird stuff, Doom Patrol okay. is right up your alley because they went full Grant Morrison in oh, last nice. week's episode with cool. like pulling directly from the storyline with Willoughby Kipling, their version, the Doom Patrol version of John Constantine. Wow. And, okay. And, and the cult of the unwritten book. So it's right there from Doom Patrol 31 to 33. So hmm. they went full weird Grant Morrison and it's beautiful. Interesting. Highly recommended this show. Definitely recommend checking it out. If you're not, you're on the fence about DC Universe, uh, check out Doom Patrol. It's basically Netflix worthy show. Show that could, okay. be on, could be on Netflix, but isn't. It's on DC Universe. So highly check that out. Uh, so we're reviewing that. And uh, Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast, of course, that I do with Jesse Jackson. And uh, also, we're doing a lot of guest hosts. Mm -hmm. And before we talked about this on the podcast this week, I finally asked Zan if she would be on Next Stop Everywhere. (laughs) And she gladly agreed to. Yes, absolutely. So we're going to talk some Doctor Who. So we're going to get. Team Ghostwood on Next Stop Everywhere. So that is going to be a fun crossover. I am totally geeking out over that. I am so excited. And I can't wait to talk the episode that we're planning to talk about. I'm not going to talk about it yet, though. Okay. I'm going to tease that. That's a yeah. That's a teaser. But it's a really effed up episode, and I really can't wait to talk about it. It is. It's a it's a fan it's a fan favorite guilty pleasure episode. That's all I'm going to tell you. And it's yeah. So and. Um, Featuring one of the 80s doctors. I'll just spoil that. Featuring an 80s doctor and uh, the best companion. <laughs> Prove me wrong. <laughs> no, we'll see. I'm sure I'm sure there are people who will be willing to debate you on that one. I'm but, sure they will. Yes. But, I'm but, sure they will. But. but your favorite companion is definitely top five, if not top three. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. I will yeah. definitely give you that. Because uh, she's one of my favorites. All right. So, yeah, um, so if I tease that enough, otherwise, um, that's it for Ghostwood. Next week, we're going to talk, of course, The Condemned Woman. And we're going to talk some Josie Packard at long last. We're going to talk some Josie Packard, some gonna, Thomas Eckhart. We're going to dive deep into what's up with Josie Packard. What's, we're, and Coop, what happened to Josie? What happened to Josie? So, yeah. Nobody freaking knows. I don't even, th- you know, I don't even know if Bob knows. I don't think so either. <laughs> no, yeah. it, it would have been funny if like Bob had gone, no, really, Coop, what happened to Josie? Nobody told me. No, seriously, because that drawer pull thing, I've never seen that before in my life. And I am, I am immortal. <laughs> like That was some weird crap, man. <laughs> that was, uh, <laughs> Coop, it blew my mind. <laughs> what are we going to do? My brain, the only person my brain exploded. Yeah. Where Josie is, is probably Major Briggs. Probably. So we're next. Probably. Because we never really got a good real answer. She's in the zone. Yeah. You know. we, somewhere Major Head Major Briggs's head is floating around in space. Somewhere Major Briggs's head is with all of this knowledge and we just can't we can't mine it. We can't find right. it out. Right. Cooper needs to go back and go, Hey, Major Briggs, what about Josie? Nobody ever told us. What year is this? What year is this? <laughs> what drawer pool is this? Yeah, seriously. And uh, what drawer knob is this? Yeah, because yeah, you get Bob's been a lot of places, but he's never been at a drawer pull knob. So yeah, I was still I was still hoping that um, when we talked about Twin Peaks: The Return and they had that that buzzing noise, you know, I that, was hoping that, that would be Jesse because it's at the ben, Great Northern that Ben and Beverly were trying to locate the source yes. of the noise. I was hoping that would have led right to the room where Josie. That's exactly what I wanted. See, that's if I was writing it, that's what I would have done. I, yeah. So, just me. Did they ever find out what that was? I mean, you didn't even have to bring Joan Chen if Joan Chen was not available. 
That's the thing. They never really did I find out what that bucket was. I would have at least addressed it. Yeah. They never did really find out what that buzzing was. So no, I'm no. Call, I'm calling it. It's Josie. Okay, we'll do, we'll just do our own head cannon and say yeah. that was that buzzing sound was Josie. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's what we're that's what we're saying. We're, and then we're you know until somebody tells us otherwise, that's it. Come come fight us, internet. Yeah, debate us. Yeah. <laughs> Bring it. Debate debate me. Oh yeah, seriously. Right. I got my coffee cup. Prove me wrong. <laughs> there you go. Seriously. All right, so everybody come on back. We're going to talk Josie Packard, and we'll see you next time right here on Ghost with the Twin Peaks Podcast. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Bye.